How are we doing? All right. So, hey, thanks for the invitation, uh, Ryan, Clay, and the rest of the crew at Balchem. Uh, glad to be here. So, Pete may kill me for this, but uh, lest you think that Pete is always a uh, serious scientist, there might be in existence uh, iPhone videos of both him and I uh, each riding mechanical bulls in New Zealand. Uh, good luck finding them. Okay, they're not on YouTube, although you know maybe see Peter at the barbecue and we'll see what happens. Uh, but anyways, that may not be as glamorous as you, as you might uh, as you might think. He did better than I did. How's that? So can you guys hear me? Okay, uh, Mike is the mic okay? Not cutting out. Okay, great. So. Um, so again, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to get right. We're going to get right into it. And my task was to talk about uh, methyl nutrition in the in the transition cow and impacts on performance. Okay, you know I think our speakers have made the case that, that uh, and I'm going to focus really on choline and methionine. I'm not going to talk about folic acid, betaine, or others in any meaningful way. Christian did a great job with folic acid and, and related. I'm going to focus my presentation on choline and methionine because of uh, the industry discussion focus therein. Of course, both these things have uh, essential roles in mammalian metabolism. Methionine is critical from a standpoint of protein synthesis, uh, methyl donation, cysteine biosynthesis. Uh, choline, as has been pointed out, roles in, uh, in uh, uh, fat metabolism, acetylcholine, cell membrane, and then betaine, et cetera. Okay? And all the speakers have also shown variations of some of the interconversions anyway, or potential relationships between these molecules. And, and again, uh, so I don't need to, I'm not going to belabor that one, okay? So, you know, one of the things we know, and this was a classic study done in goats back in the early 80s, uh, was that uh, where they actually looked at irreversible loss, looked at interconversion anyway, and so they looked at uh, entry rate here of choline, of methionine, and then they said, okay, how much choline methyl goes to methionine? They said zero, or at least they measured zero. And, you know, how much methyl uh, from methionine goes to choline? And they measured that part of the methionine does go to choline. So, uh, you know, methionine methyl conversion accounted for 28% of methionine entry rate and 6% of the choline pool in goats. Okay, so again, I think we really need more work along these lines to really try to truly understand quantitatively these conversions out there. Okay. So, you know, it's reasonable then to, to hypothesize or speculate anyway that, that there are interrelations between supplies of methionine and choline in transition cows, okay? Um, you know, supplying methionine might be able to meet some of the need for, for choline, okay? Uh, and also, in converse anyway, supplying choline might be able to spare or meet some of the need for methionine. So, it's reasonable to ask those questions, okay? My point is, or where I'm going to go here, is, is what do the studies actually tell us about choline and methionine transition cows? And I'm a firm believer uh, that at the end of the day, the cows always tell the truth, right? The cow's biology always tells the truth. And so, and I think we've amassed enough data here in these, in these uh, across studies looking at choline and also methionine that we can get a sense anyway for where the story plays out, okay? Um, punch, bottom line, right? And I'll tell it to you right now, and then you can start dreaming about beers by the pool and things like that. Uh, both are important, okay? Both have, have distinct biological functions in the cow. I don't think there's meaningful uh, substitution for one and the other, okay? Again, that story is probably yet to be fully told, but that's kind of the punchline. So now I'm going to take you through my, my case for why. Again, uh, Joe, Joe alluded to Richard Erdman's work um, early in the 90s, where they really were the first ones to really kind of ex thoroughly look at choline, uh, demonstrate that it really did need to be room protected in order to deliver meaningful amounts of choline to the cow. And of course, this preceded uh, you know, what we now refer to as the transition cow. And so they fed uh, increasing amounts of a protected choline chloride, looked at milk yield uh, by week postpartum, and bottom line showed pretty nice results overall to, to choline supplementation in room protected form. Okay. Then we came along, and this was really the, the first study uh, kind of done after, er well, actually, I'm sorry, second study done after Erdman. Um, anyways, I'll show you the other one. We fed uh, uh, increasing amounts of choline in uh, protected form. This is actually the amount of choline uh, chloride itself. So this would be 60 grams per day of the actual room protected source. Uh, we did provide some uh, fed diets, providing some corn gluten meal to provide some methionine. Now, obviously, if you're truly balancing amino acids, you know, given lysine and things like that, you are not going to use corn gluten meal per se, but we were trying to acknowledge anyway that there might be, again, you know, some, we didn't want to be truly, totally deficient in methionine in our particular work, okay? Look here, we had uh, quadratic trends anyway for increased uh, production of milk. 
uh, and fat corrected milk with choline supplementation or a choline trend here, you know, et cetera. So in general, showing some evidence also for increased uh, performance in these cows, again, as we fed increasing amounts of, of protected choline. Okay. It's also done in the days when, uh, you know, we, we thought the 12 cows for treatment was enough in transition cow studies, and we've really changed that, uh, that view anyway, and, and we don't do anything with under about 25 to 30 cows for treatment at this point in time. Again, this is uh, back out of the gate, and as a, as a, as a brand new assistant professor, been on the job two months, I was just glad to have the opportunity to do some research, so, uh, but it was a good place to start. Look at uh, concentrations of triglyceride here. Nothing is not significant here, these effects, but again, the, the pattern would be to see potentially decreased uh, concentrations of liver triglyceride. You know, and cows fed, uh, fed protected, increasing amounts of protected choline. Again, you see these results again with more cows, with better approaches, or at least more, more replicated approaches, you know, certainly have kind of held up. Did see some increased concentrations of glycogen in the liver from these cows. Again, that was significant anyway, and, and again, the effects were, were linear there as well. Of course, one of the things we can do is we can use some old-fashioned, uh, you know, radio-labeled uh, in vitro chemistry and, and things like that and look at uh, what's often been termed the, the biology of dying tissue, which is you, you biopsy liver from cows, you take it back to the lab, you slice it up, you, in, you incubate it with, uh, with essential radio-labeled substrate anyway, and then you look at conversion to products, okay? And so you can take, uh, you can do things like, uh, you know, label, uh, you know, uh, label or radio label uh, palmit, uh, palmitic acid or, or C16, and look at conversion of that to, to CO2, uh, to store to esterified products here. Uh, you can label propionate, look at conversion to glucose and things like that, okay? So one of the things we found anyway was we did see, you know, and again, so we can actually look at you know, what I'm going to show you here is look at uh, conversion in the or capacity of conversion of these uh, radio labeled uh, NEFA to, to CO2, and then also to store to serified products, which would be a proxy for lipid accumulation in the liver itself. Okay. So, what we found anyway is no effect anyway on, on oxidation here, but increasing amounts of protected choline. We did see a trend for, de for a linear decrease anyway for uh, conversion to a serified products, which would imply which would imply that we were exporting more uh, out of the liver's VLDL versus storing them as fat. Again, you know, fairly modest effect there overall, but again, directionally fitting what we think happens there. Okay. And then, uh, you know, if you look at propionate to CO2, again, no, uh, no significant effects there, but, you know, certainly the, you know, the, 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 the dogma or, and with some work certainly to support it is that, you know, if we have lower triglyceride accumulation, liver working better, we're going to get better gluconeogenic capacity from things like propionate. Okay. So Rick Grummer came along, uh, their group, and they looked at, uh, at protected choline supplementation in, in a feed restriction model. And essentially this is one where they, where they restrict feed intake um, and then get triglyceride accumulation or potential triglyceride accumulation and see how treatment affects that. And then they also uh, looked at the disposal side. Again, Joe showed the work from uh, Zenobi anyway that, that again, uh, you know, was the same model anyway done here, here at University of Florida. Kind of bottom line there here in this study is that they did show uh, decreases in triglyceride accumulation with protecting choline supplementation. And they also uh, saw that uh, protecting choline facilitated disposal um, in that model. So just kind of cruising through some of the other work here, feeding uh, protected choline to transition cows. Uh, the work out of Purdue here, you know, feeding protected choline, increased milk yield when cows were fed lower RUP, uh, decrease with, with higher RUP. Again, I'm not, not fully certain about uh, or don't have a great explanation there. Did see uh, liver triglyceride content decrease by feeding protected choline to higher BCS cows, um, at least in one of the treatments. Missouri, uh, protecting choline, increased milk yield by about five pounds a day. Italian work, increased milk yield by six pounds a day. Uh, decreased NEFA and the NEFA cholesterol ratio day of calving. Okay, work out of Guelph here, uh, protecting choline, increased milk yield by 2.6 pounds a day. Uh, effects on NEFA's ketones and liver composition were significant. Um, again, work done overseas, uh, again, about six pounds more fat-corrected milk. Uh, you know, nine to 10 pounds per day more milk, decreased liver triglycerides, circulating BHBAs, okay? Uh, again, uh, you know, protected choline, increased milk protein yield, decreased liver triglyceride, but didn't affect blood nephers or ketones, uh, increased uh, expression of genes related to processing of fatty acids, VLDL, 
Illinois work here protecting choline, about five pounds per day of energy of fat corrected milk was not significant in their study. And again, work down south uh, protecting choline increased fat corrected milk by about four pounds a day um, in one experiment and about two pounds a day in, the, in another experiment. Okay. And then finally, again, the Zenobi work uh, done down here, uh, you know, actually there's even a new, there's an immune paper out since I, since I put this slide set together, uh, 93 multiparous cows, four treatments, protected choline and two different uh, prepartum dietary strategies, got, uh, you know, increased milk yield, energy corrected milk across the first 15 weeks of lactation, and then uh, increased milk yield by about five pounds over the first 40 weeks, okay, when they stopped feeding uh, choline at 21 days after calving. Um, NEPAs and ketones were not altered, liver triglycerides were similar, uh, you know, see colostrum with higher IgG content, uh, some, you know, at least some hint here for potentially for effects on the calves, right, for greater body weight gain through 50 weeks of age, and results were largely independent of the prepartum diet, right, so the main effect of choline largely ruled the day. And again, as Joe alluded to, you know, in a companion study uh, protecting choline dose dependently, decreased liver triglycerides in that feed restriction model. Okay, so meta-analysis that I don't think is quite published yet. I keep looking for it, um, uh, but it was it was done out of University of Florida, and uh, and was was done as an abstract here. Um, you know, this last year at Dairy Science, and so they did a meta-analysis looking at uh, protecting colony supplementation. Um, you know, they basically uh, you know excluded experiments where it wasn't fed as a protected source. That makes sense, right? Given what we know about the need to protect. Uh, choline fed during only the pre or postpartum period. There are not many of those studies at all, um, at least that I'm not, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, cows fed feed restricted or uh, cows reporting data for only nulliparous null cows, which again, very, very, I would think very, very few of those, okay? Um, so again, you know, they went through the usual meta-analysis type approach. And again, if you look here at uh, these graphs are all set up the same way with intake of choline ion, grams per day here on, on the x-axis response variable on the Y, uh, DMI prepartum, you know, pretty flat, okay, so not much effect there. Uh, DMI postpartum, probably variable to maybe some increases here and some flat, but you start looking at milk yield, energy corrected milk, you know, I think you can see the patterns here, and again, if you do the, the forest plot over here, you know, again, with all the studies that were included here in the data set, and a weighted mean difference of about, of about 1.6 kilos a day, right? So it's three to four pounds of milk, which again, jives largely with what we see, you know, at least through the, in just listing of studies, um, you know, through the rest of the data set here, okay? So just to summarize, uh, research feeding protected choline in transition cows, uh, consistently positive effects on milk yield and early lactation, uh, mechanism consistent with improved fatty acid metabolism and increased export as VLDL. Um, Effects on blood metabolites are inconsistent, okay? And I think that actually makes sense, right? I mean, I, you know, it's not gonna be, um, you know, certainly sometimes do see increased NEFA or decreased, I'm sorry, NEFA in their blood ketones, but, you know, I think the inconsistency there is logical because there's, there's not a mechanism there by which it's gonna be either directly anti-lipolytic nor anti-ketogenic, right? So unlike some other things we, we might do in diets or otherwise, which are gonna be potentially directly uh, decreasing NEFA and or decreasing ketones, uh, you know, BH or choline is not going to do that. It's going to focus on liver export of fat, right? And the whole deal ought to work better, right? But it's not going to necessarily show up all the time in those markers, right? So just a caution there, okay? Because some people, again, want to do stuff like that, and they think they're going to see something in blood markers that people routinely measure. You might, okay? But just because you don't see that doesn't mean you're not having some type of positive effect on what's going on in the cow, okay? All right, what about methionine? Okay, um, what I've got on this table is I've got uh, three, four, five, six, seven different studies in which methionine was fed uh, in various forms or in one, this case actually infused uh, to cows during the transition period. And um, I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail here, but these again have various forms uh, ranging from, uh, you know, uh, an encapsulator protected methionine. These again were infused. This was an analog of methionine. Uh, again, methionine with or without folic acid B12, and Christian, I think, referred to this study. Um, the isopropyl ester of, of HMTBA, um, and in, the, in Ryan's study here, Illinois study, and again, another Illinois study here with protected methionine. 
And, you know, again, in general, showing fairly nice reproduction responses here to, to methionine supplementation, right? So you're looking at, you know, three kilos or so of, of either fat-corrected milk or energy-corrected milk. Uh, you know, no effect on milk yield in this study, increased milk protein. Uh, no effect on milk yield in this study. Both treatments increased milk protein percent. And again, increased, uh, you know, yields of energy-corrected milk in the Illinois, um, in the Illinois work, okay? So this was uh, actually the first one. I did this uh, back in the dark ages now. Uh, I was a grad student in Illinois. Uh, it was a side project. And you know, this is actually before the, you know, we actually did the study before the transition cow was a thing. And uh, so we, we started feeding uh, protected methionine uh, about 10 day, seven to 10 days before calving until eight, 18 weeks after calving, um, et cetera. Uh, so 24 cows, again, small study. Uh, seven to ten days before expected calving through 13 through I'm sorry, 18 weeks after calving, uh, zero or 20 grams per day of protective methionine by top dress, and this is the kicker. I would actually, you know, I you know a lot of us in the room review papers for Journal of Dairy Science. Uh, if I got a, a diet description of a pre-calving diet in a transition cow study like this today, I'd reject the thing, right? But at the time, it uh, it went through. So. Although I find it interesting, cows, all cows are fed once daily, typical dry cow ration consisting of grass, hay, about five kilos of dry matter, corn silage, three kilos of dry matter, a grain mix, about four kilos of dry matter, consisting of ground shell corn, soybean meal, minerals, vitamins, and a pre-calving conditioner. I'm not really sure what the pre-calving conditioner was, uh, but anyways, it, um, uh, anyhow, obviously it was... Uh, something that we bought at Illinois in a bag right at the time. The other kind of funny thing about this is this kind of actually looks like a control energy diet in a kind of a funny sort of way, right? So maybe not the way we do them now, but, uh, but not too different. So back to the future. All right. Um, Illinois diet here again at the time, uh, real simple. Um, we've come a long way too. So alfalfa silage, corn silage, ground shell corn, soybean meal, soy hulls, uh, some mins and vittles, bicarb, you know, et cetera. So that's what the diet looked like. Okay. Uh, nonetheless, right? We actually had uh, had here some some effects or trends for effects on uh, on uh, on milk fat, milk fat yield, uh, fat corrected milk here. Again, two plus kilos of fat corrected milk yield increase with the protective methionine. Uh, Mike Saha came along, right? Doing his, his PhD with at uh, UNH and. Uh, you know, was looking at uh, methionine and lysine, uh, you know, the, the cows fed, you know, some of the methionine and lysine beginning for calving had increased yields of energy corrected milk, okay? Compare with either MET or the basil. So in this case, they got the response with both uh, MET and lysine supplementation. And again, you know, see a response somewhere in the same uh, range as, as we had before, okay? This was our work here. This was the analog of uh, HMTBA, uh, or the analog of methionine with HMTBA. And what we did here was essentially what we we're trying to do with CPM dairy at the time uh, was to look at uh, a control versus a diet that would be at requirement, quote unquote, with, with CPM, and then for methionine, and then a high, uh, you know, additional level of HMTBA. And in this study, we had quadratic type responses, um, you know, in terms of milk yield and things like that, where we got a milk yield benefit here in the middle treatment. Interestingly enough, we looked at all the other things we did in that first choline study. We looked at liver triglycerides and glycogen. We looked at liver fatty acid metabolism in vitro. We looked at liver propionate metabolism in vitro and basically saw nothing, right? So we had no, so clearly, you know, acting differently um, in this study compared to, to the previous one, okay? Again, uh, you know, verdicts and Grummer here, right? Liver response to liver triglyceride HMTBA during feed restriction and also uh, uh, depletion during, during refeeding. No effect here, unlike their work with, with protected choline on liver triglycerides, okay? This was, again, the, the, uh, pr the Pranat work here. So protected methionine uh, with or without folic acid or B12. We'll focus on the methionine results here. No effects of methionine on milk yield. Uh, increased milk protein percent. Uh, liver triglyceride concentrations actually increased in this study, okay, so going actually the wrong or the opposite direction uh, as, as, again, you would speculate with methionine reaction to decrease it, okay. And then finally, Ryan's, or maybe not finally, but Ryan's work here, um, you know, diet supplement with H, the isopropyl ester or protective methionine from 21 days before expected calving through 140 days after calving. Uh, again, no effect here on yields of fat, milk or fat corrected milk, had increase in milk protein percentage. Uh, you know, by feeding both, and then effects on metabolites and liver composition weren't determined in that study. 
And then uh, getting into the Illinois work, as uh, Joan Osorio uh, published multiple papers off of, off of the same study. And so I've kind of tried to summarize the results within uh, kind of together rather than going, rather than going paper by paper. Uh, so about 38 multiparous Holstein cows. They had three treatments, uh, 21 days pre-calving to 30 days post. Uh, control essentially unsupplemented with methionine. Uh, this treatment here where they had uh, uh, HMBI, the isopropyl ester, at 0.2% of the dry matter, uh, you know, before calving. And, and again, going to 2.35% uh, of MP prepartum by NRC 2001, 2.15% of MP post. Uh, and then protected methionine, again, trying to hit similar uh, targets anyway in terms of percentage of MP, okay? In this uh, study, lysine was at 6.6667% of MP before calving and 6.162% of MP after calving. So just to, again, summarizing their results, uh, you know, cows fed methionine pre and postpartum tended to have uh, greater neutrophil sphagnostosis at 21 days after calving. So again, indicative of uh, potential cell function in those animals, okay? Lower uh, serial plasmin and serum amyloid A, so evidence of, of decreased inflammation, uh, greater plasma oxygen uh, radical absorbance capacity, greater glutathione carnitine, so uh, glutathione, again, indicative of, of better oxidative status, uh, altered gene networks and liver consistent with, with some of these things, uh, greater methylation of PPAR alpha promoter, upregulation of lipid metabolism in the liver, but again, did not uh, see any effect on liver triglyceride, okay? And, uh, and the most, some of the more, more recent work here, uh, 60 multiparous Holstein cows, again, treatments, control versus uh, methionine. Uh, you know, again, about 1.7% of MP based on NRC 2001, 22 to 2.3 based on NRC 2001 for the supplemented group. Again, it was a protective methionine study. Uh, you see the, the lysine here, et cetera, okay? Yeah, nice response. If you look at their, uh, their data here, um, nice responses relative to uh, prepartum intake, uh, you know, postpartum dry matter intake, uh, postpartum milk yield, and postpartum energy corrected milk. Okay, so again, showing reasonable consistency response, certainly with methionine supplementation uh, during transition. And they also started, of course, go down the path of, of, of beginning to say, okay, what else is going on here? Um, you know, relative to effects on the calf, epigenetic type, type effects and things like that. In this study, um, you know, prepartum protected methionine, increased calf birth weight, upregulated upper amino acid transport and modulated the mTOR signaling pathway um, in the placentome. So again, you know, this whole, you know, I and others in the transition cow are, are guilty of not probably doing enough in terms of trying to figure out what's going on in the calves. And obviously that's really starting now, right? And Florida's done a, lot, done a bunch of that work now. And others, the rest of us are starting to do that as well, where we're trying to say, okay, what, what effects are we having um, on that calf or, uh, you know, based on how we, how we manage or feed pre-calving. Um, again, another work, more work, Ill work from Illinois focused on the calf. So again, 20 days before calving to calving. Uh, with control or protected methionine, uh, similar birth weight average daily gain to seven weeks, lower reactive oxygen metabolites at 14 days, and trend for lower seroplasmin, alterations anyway in insulin signaling, glucose metabolism, and also liver met choline homocysteine. So again, I think is, there's still a bunch to sort out here. I think in terms of exactly what's going on there, but you know the data certainly indicate that there's something going there's something going on anyway that we need to further uh, pay attention to. So just to summarize here, you know, overall summary, feeding uh, protective methionine HMTBA or HMBI, um, you know, I would say also pretty consistently positive effects on milk yield and or milk protein. Uh, does not appear to relate to liver fatty acid or glucose metabolism, steering us more to down a, an immune function, oxidative metabolism, liver functionality uh, mechanism here. Just in, in support of this, uh, this was actually a summer intern project that uh, a student in, uh, in our, Kristen Gallagher, who uh, uh, is uh, hopefully going to be going to grad school next year, uh, Barry, okay, uh, and <laughs> not to put you on the spot. I got a thumbs up anyway, that's cool. All right, so she's currently an intern at Minor, so uh, she's a great, great, great young, young uh, person anyway. So summer internship project, uh, you know, kind of joint between Adiseo, Perina, Cornell, uh, conducted summer 2018 on uh, 12 commercial dairies. Uh, you know, basically they, um, what we did is, is we had uh, uh, 
had, had cows from these dairies and these 12 herds anyway, uh, you know, that were, that were either enrolled in control or experiment in which the postpartum diet essentially was supplemented with protective amino acid, protective methionine. Okay, so we were not, uh, we were not holding the prepartum diet subject to, uh, to supplementation. So it was only postpartum diets. And part of that idea was to get both, right? But the reality of finding herds and, you know, getting, by the time we got herds enrolled, we really needed to focus on what was going on postpartum. So bottom line, these herds are focused on uh, po or postpartum uh, supplementation with protective methionine. We were interested in, uh, in, in trying to take some of the work that uh, Travisi and Bertoni had done overseas, uh, where they looked at a metabolite health index or liver, liver, liver functionality index and, and say, you know, can we, where they actually have two, you have sample cows at two time points and things like that. Can we, can we come up with a one time point kind of approach here that fits some of the other stuff that we do when we look at ketones and things like that and actually kind of come up with a metabolite health index. And this, so you see it's based on albumin, cholesterol, and bilirubin. Um, uh, you know, and again, it's based really on, it's adapted from the Bertoni and, and Trevisi work. So a couple things here, right? So one unit increase in, in metabolite health index resulted in about 1.3 kgs of energy corrected milk response in these cows. Um, and based on that range could explain a fair amount of, of early lactation energy corrected milk on a cow basis, okay? Um, you know, one unit increase in MHI resulted in uh, 0.9 kgs of week four milk. Um, and again, you know, explained a fairly good range. Cows from herds fed uh, protective methionine had greater uh, metabolite health index than those fed, uh, than the herds not fed protective methionine. So, you know, there was evidence of, of better, uh, better metabolic health and things like that. And again, those herds fed methionine uh, actually did make more milk as well. So that did, I didn't have that data, that data point in there, but they did. So interactions and relationships. Okay, Joe showed this, these data from Tawny Chandler, um, PhD work with Heather White, um, showing differential responses of, uh, of choline and methionine on VLDL, uh, uh, you know, VLDL uh, relationships there, showing you know, more VLDL uh, excretion export here with choline chloride. We're not a relationship here with methionine, okay? And then finally, uh, this was just one study I, uh, that I pulled from, actually from, from China, where they had uh, 48 multiparous Chinese Holsteins, had four treatments, a control, protected choline, uh, protected methionine, and then the combination of the two. Okay, so um, you see what they were doing there. 21 days before expected calving through 21 days after calving. Okay, so in this case, both uh, protected methionine and choline increased prepartum and postpartum intake and, and fat-corrected milk. Uh, both protected methionine and protected choline decreased postpartum concentrations of NEFA, BHBA increased glucose, uh, similar effects on various indices of octave status. Interaction terms were, were not significant for virtually all outcomes, suggesting potential for um, additivity of response. Okay, and again, the data kind of looked that way. Okay, so bottom line here, um, you know, choline and methionine, both important nutrients in the, in the cow. Uh, responses to choline consistently increased milk yield. Uh, the mechanism consistent with improved liver fatty acid metabolism, uh, inconsistent effects on NEFA or BHPA, uh, and again, that's going to be logical. Okay, response to methionine, increased milk yield, milk protein percentage. Uh, I say less consistent, but still, I say reasonably consistent overall with milk yield. Mechanisms uh, do not appear to, to really relate to the mechanisms look to be different, right? Relating to oxidative status or immune function and effects on liver functionality versus liver fatty acid metabolism per se. Both uh, certainly are looking to have uh, effects of relevance to the calf, but we need more work to kind of sort some of this stuff out. And again, I think there's potential for additivity. So with that, uh, I want to thank you very much for Balchem again for the invitation, you all for your attention, and I hope that you have a great conference here. Okay, thanks so much. And I know, the, I know these presentations are being recorded. I'm going to pause here so you have lots of time. Please uh, delete that little thing about Pete and I and mechanical bulls, OK? I, I wouldn't want him and me to go viral or any, anything like that out there in the, in the world. I, th I think he said to highlight that, actually, is what I heard. Uh, do we have any uh, questions for Dr. Overton? Question here in the middle.
Yeah, I just got my curiosity up. We talked about lowering ceruloplasm with these treatments. And ceruloplasm is a copper-containing enzyme that converts ferrous iron to ferric iron in the reticulocyte. And I was just, it's kind of wild and off the wall about why it would affect that. Well, I, again, I, I think if you just think about in, inflammation, and I realize there's other nutrients obviously that affect that as well, right? But if you think about inflammatory mechanisms, it would make sense that we're affecting inflammation overall in the animal that we may be having effects on seroplasmin and things like that, independent of other maybe nutrients in the diet and things like that. Yep. Other questions? They're ready for uh, poolside. Ready. A lot of northerners here ready to work on vitamin D status. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Get rid of our pasty white skin. All right. Okay. Thanks. No more questions. Thank you. One last round of applause, please.